As you are taking your seat, if you would turn with me to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 3. Now, I am, uh, I am not sure whose idea it was when Jonathan and Dusty and I got together and we started to plan out what are we going to do in the summer. I, I don't know whose idea it was to go through Titus. Um, if you've enjoyed the study, it was mine, um, but most likely... It was, it was Jonathan's, but when I heard it, I was, I was excited uh, because I love the book. It's a great book, uh, but also I was familiar with it because I taught before. And I thought, you know what, I can use some of that knowledge uh, to help me in my preparation. And then I, I looked at my old lessons from Titus and I was like, I spent a whole lesson on verse 8. I got to cover the whole thing in three weeks. How am I going to do that? And so I started out by doing only two verses last Sunday night. And I am hoping to get through one verse tonight, but I don't want to shortchange you next week. I'm not just going to zoom through, all right? So I'm going to give you kind of a working knowledge of the first seven verses, I hope, and we will finish things next Sunday night, which I am excited about. You turn to, to Titus chapter 3. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to be your children, to have placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to your house tonight to worship you through song, through fellowship, through the study of your word. And I pray, Father, that we would be true to your word and we would apply it to our life. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, the theme of the book of Titus is adorning the doctrine of God. And as I mentioned last Sunday night, we don't use the word adorn in casual conversation, but the idea is similar to what you would see with our children's ministry, where in our children's ministry, we encourage the leaders to put Jesus on display. And I know Jonathan had that kind of theme that he was using, and so I, I took it and I use it for the youth group as well, is we want to take the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and we want to live them out so we give a clear and accurate picture of who he is. We're familiar with displays and, and people trying to catch our attention or sell us stuff and things along those lines. And I don't know where it came from, but we all know that there is a dog in the window. And we know that someone is wondering how much is that dog in the window. Now, the dog that was put in the window isn't your, your, your crippled, beat-up dog, all right? They did not put the three-legged dog in the window. They did not put the one-eyed dog or the dog with the underbite in the window. Why is that? So that when you're passing by the store and you see the dog, you think, wow, that is adorable. I must have that dog. At least it draws you inside. They put the good dog there, the pretty one, the cute little puppy. They don't advertise all of the negative things that are going to happen. They put that puppy on display. We also are familiar with the idea of display when it comes to wedding rings, which is a, a symbol of our devotion to our spouse. And what that really means is hands off, he's mine. Or I'm with him. We are displaying that for the world to know. Well, in our life, when we take the doctrine, the teachings of God, and we live that out, what we are saying is, I am God's. And we give a clear picture of who Jesus is. Now, why do we put Jesus on display? For what purpose? Obviously, for the glory of God. Thanking him for what he has done and for what he has called us to. But also for the edification of believers. And you see this in the book of Titus. In Titus chapter 1, uh, Titus is to appoint elders in the different cities. These men are to, to lead the churches. And he is supposed to pick those who are living out the teachings of the Christian faith. And, and they are to refute and reject those that are not living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you get to chapter 2. And it's about um, life within the church. Uh, that we are to be sensible and self-controlled. And so uh, Paul walks through and he talks to, to Titus about instructing the older men to be this and the older women to be that and the young men to be this and so forth. And all of that's in the context of the church and how we interact with one another. Well, when we get to chapter three, the transition is to the gospel and living in this world for the glory of Jesus Christ. And so when we put on the teachings of Jesus, we can represent him accurately to the nations. 
In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, there is a key point in verse 8 where it says, These things are good and profitable for men. And it's talking about pagan men in the society. Uh, Obviously, these things are good for the the church and for the believer and things along those uh, uh, as well. But the idea is that the unbeliever, these things are profitable for them. John MacArthur calls this section the Christian's responsibility in a pagan society. I have decided to title it Living an Evangelistic Life. And last Sunday night was part one. So here we are with part two. And my hope and my prayer is as you come today, you are ready to learn and you are ready to live out this evangelistic life that God has called you to. And it's not a foreign concept to us, right? We are to let our light shine before men so that what? They can see how awesome we are and how cool we are. No, so that they can see our good deeds and glorify our Father who is in heaven. That's the picture. That's the idea that's going on in the book of Titus and especially in chapter 3. We started out last week by looking at the reminders and we see this in verse 1 and 2. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing consideration, sorry, every consideration for all men. Well, how is Titus to do this? Well, you go back to verse 15 of chapter 2 when he said, these things speak Exhort, reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Teach your people the word of God. Challenge them with the word of God. And here, remind them of these things that they are supposed to do. And what are these things? To be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient. Our submission to our government and those rulers that have been placed over us by God give a clear picture of who Jesus Christ is. We are to be ready for every good deed. We are to malign no one. Uh, loving people, not speaking uh, Poorly of them, it's also called dishonoring others. That's not us, that's not what we do. To be peaceable, to be gentle, which uh, there's a a, a parallel passage and it's talking about the idea of a a gentle boss, a, a fair boss, a yielding boss, and that's what we are supposed to be. And in that, we are showing every consideration for all men. And so Christian, this is us. This is the doctrine that we need to put on and live out. And when we do that, this pagan society gets a clear picture of Jesus Christ so that they will repent and believe in him as well. I want to focus real quick on two of these because they're kind of all encompassing to be ready for every good deed and showing every consideration for all men. Now that's kind of a a nice and all encompassing list, right? Every good deed, every consideration for all men. And so what I want to do is I want to walk through some practical ways to do this and to flesh this out. And I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord, that you have to do these things. You might have others that you would add on this list and tweaks along the lines. But uh, I think a number of you walked away last Sunday night and said, wow, yeah, I want to be a light How how do I do that? Who can I come into contact with? How do I interact with these unbelievers? What are some ways I can do that? Well, I I have titled this uh, two different ways. There are ways that you can be ready for every good deed and show every consideration for all men through the church. Programs, ministries, events that are going on right here. But then also outside the church, not like you're going rogue or something like that, all right? You're, you're throwing off the shackles of CBC. The idea is outside the walls of this church or it, it's not a program that has been put together for you. For instance, there are a number of ongoing ministries that if you are a part of them or if you take the time to invite people to, they can see your submission to authority. They can see that you're ready for every good deed. They can see that you are gentle and all of those things. So you have a platform. Like for instance, international friends. You're talking about, you know, uh, the desire for the Christian to go out into the world and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. (laughs) We got the world coming here. 
All right, I don't know the exact numbers, but I believe there's uh, probably 30 different countries or something like that that were represented. People that come up on a Thursday and we teach them English. But in that, we also teach them the good news of Jesus Christ. And, and we need helpers and we need workers to be able to do that. And it's a, a life on life type of ministry, something very practical. Uh, our Kids Beach Club, if you're not familiar with it, is something that uh, we started a couple of years ago. At, uh, it used to be in Rock and Ball in the South Lake School District. Now it's at Beck Elementary uh, where my kids are going to school. And we have a ministry and Paul McCollum uh, heads that up. And we get to, after school, have a Bible study. So we have a Bible study. In our numbers last year, I think we had like 20 kids on the roster and most of them were countrysiders. Uh, this year we had about 90 kids that were on the roster. And they come in and we, we teach the good news. Um, we also have our Awana ministries. And we assume that most of the kids are at Awana, uh, that they know the Lord. All right? Our own kids need the gospel. But also there's lots of visitors that come. And there's lots of parents that come and drop them off as well. Uh, our women's Bible study is a great opportunity. Something that's already being put together that you can invite someone to. And, and you never know. What's the worst thing they can do? Is They could tell you no, right? But at least you tried and made that effort. Uh, the pre, uh, preschool play date, which goes on on Fridays. I mean, what, what uh, young lady in the summer wouldn't want to bring her kids up in the air conditioning and play in the jungle gym? And it's not that we, you know, they sit them down and they share the gospel with them. They share their life. They talk about their life and through that there's conversations that lead to the gospel. We also have many special events here at Countryside. You're familiar with Vacation Bible School. I heard a number of comments from visitors that came and were like, wow, the preparation, the love, everything you put into this, you did this for my kid? And when you take care of people's kids, they notice that. And a wonderful tool to share the gospel and to reach out to others. Whether you're serving at those things or whether you're attending those things. Our, our kids basketball this past August was a great outreach opportunity. We also have the countryside fair you can invite people to. And on and on. Our backyard Bible club ministry where, where countrysiders open up their homes and neighborhood kids come. And we share the gospel with them for a few days over spring break. There's lots of things. All right, Our church already has programs and events. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just need to invite people to them. All right. We, we need to serve at them so that we can get the good news of Jesus Christ. All right. There are others going on. The Countryside Classic Golf Tournament you can invite men to. Our Christmas concerts is also a great venue. But what about outside the church? I think inside the church, um, you strolled through the ministry fair, so you are up to date on all of these things. Uh, but what about outside the church? It can be a little harder. Uh, what about in your neighborhood? Be available. Be available. I, I know it's hot in the summer, but sometimes you just have to, to be outside. You know, in our old neighborhood, there's lots of kids that would play in the front. And uh, we were scared ours were going to get run over by cars. So we would go out there as well. Uh, but with that, we, we got to open up conversations with people. And it wasn't every time that I saw them that I said, hey, do you know you're a sinner and that you need Jesus? No, you just interact and you talk with them. And I know that y'all are doing the same thing in your own neighborhood. Share a meal with them. Invite someone over. Uh, not that, you know, as soon as they walk in, you hit them over the head with the Bible. Get to know them, listen to them, love them. And, and there is that danger where you just do that, but then you never open up the, <laughs> God's truth. Don't forget to share the gospel as well. Offer to help in a time of need. Um, you know, watch their kids when they need help. Now, I'm not saying you have to be their nannies or anything like that, but you know, they, they got something busy coming up. You say, hey, why don't you just drop your kids off? When you take care of people's kids, they realize that you love them and care for them. Invite them to do a Bible study and you think, well, that, that, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Some of you were mentioning this last Sunday night after the lesson. Do it. Ask someone one-on-one, -on -one, hey, would you want to do a Bible study with me? I have a Bible study I'd like to give you. Would you like to get together? And you never know what's going on. And the idea is, if we don't open up to people, all right, I'm not proposing that we neglect the church, fellowship with the church, have people from the church over, do things with the church. But we also need to have that outreach and that impact, that evangelistic life. We can also do things in schools. Uh, I know with Northwest ISD, you can be a mentor where you sign up and weekly you, you, you get to mentor someone and pour into someone. Uh, you can volunteer in different ways and make yourself uh, known and your beliefs known in those areas as well when it's appropriate. Uh, at work, your work ethic, 
You know, you talk about being obedient to authorities, uh, you being obedient to your boss, you not, you know, stabbing people in the back and talking bad about them and things like that. Uh, working hard is unto the Lord. That is a great witness. But then also you can, you can buy them lunch. And keep in mind there's this, this fine line between you're not getting paid well, unless you work at the church like I do, you're not getting paid to sit down and just, you know, share the gospel with everyone that comes by. But there's appropriate times during your, your coffee breaks or at lunch or something like that, that you can, you can do those types of things. All right. And now I'm not saying that you have to walk away and implement all of these things in your life. I'm just saying, if you're looking at this and you're saying, wow, I want to live for Jesus. How do I get involved in people's lives? What are some practical ways? Here we are. And I want you to flip to 1 Corinthians 9. And I made reference to this in my closing, but I, I didn't quite get into it. And I want us to look at Paul, because remember it's Paul who's telling them to live this way in this pagan society. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. And, and again, for Paul, it's not a pride thing. Here's all the people that I won. He, he loved the people and he didn't want to trick them into Christ. He wanted to confront them of their sin and tell them of the beauties of the forgiveness that he offers. Verse 20, to the Jews I became a Jew. Why? So that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law is under the law, not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those without the law is without the law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that uh, I may by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. And that challenge there is, do you do all things for the sake of the gospel? I know your time is valuable. I know your time is precious. But are you living for the sake of the gospel? Are you just talking about it? Sometimes at a church like this, we can come and be a sponge and be fed and be fed and be fed. And we need someone to squeeze us out on the world so that we can give that goodness to other people. He goes on to say in verse 24, do you not know that those who run a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And I know that there's an element of this. This is talking about the sanctification of the believer. I run this race to glorify God and so forth. But look at the context here. He's talking about evangelism. You're in a race. Run so that you may win and so that you may win people to Christ. Everyone who competes in the game exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. I understand that you have a lot of work to do in this life and that you have families to keep up with and you have relationships to build within the church. That's great. But self-control and diligence and a willingness just to pour it all out, reach out to people, love them so that they can see Christ. And honestly, how hard is it? How hard is it to be different than the rest of the world? It's not very this world is saturated with materialism and me, myself, and I and all of those things. And when we just love people because we love Jesus, they're going to pick up on that. It's going to be to God's glory. Well, number one would be the reminders. Number two would be the importance of the reminders. And we're going to find that in verses three through seven. Three through seven. With the importance of the reminders, we see who we were. Who we were. For we also once were foolish ourselves. Who we were. And then I, I know I'm, I'm in danger. Sometimes if I give you the whole outline, you're tempted to zone out. Which is, it's really interesting. Because this is the first time I've taught in here with a PowerPoint. And some of you are looking there. And some of you are looking there. And then some of you just gave up. And you're just looking forward, all right? Hopefully you'll be able to power through. Who we were. And I'm going to go ahead and give you my outline for the, the next several verses, Okay. What happened to us, or sorry, who happened to us in verses four through six? Who we were, who happened to us, who we are now, 
And we won't get there tonight, but in verses 8 through 11, we see what we do now. What we do now. In this, let's start with who we were. And I think sometimes when we pull this verse out of the context that it's in, we, we don't see the beauty of this verse. We understand what Paul is writing, right? Through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we can understand what Paul was writing. But look at the context of it. Why does he say this? He says, for. So there is a connection back. These reminders that are given, this way they're supposed to live in a pagan society to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and put them on display. And then he goes, for. So there's a reasoning for this. And what are the implications? We're going to walk through this. We're going to walk through this verse. But I want to start with what the implications are that are drawn from who we were. Uh, why is this important? Why did Paul go here next in his argument to Titus? The first implication would be so that we understand not to act like that anymore. We understand not to act like that anymore. As we read through this, we were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. We read that in the context of living for the Lord in society and we go, that can't be me anymore. We also once were. We are different now. 2 Corinthians 5.17. We are a new, uh, new creation. We are new creatures. That's not us anymore. And while we still struggle with this unredeemed humanness. And there are times that we, we slip and we do these things that we don't want to. But overall our patterns. That's not us. Because we need to put Christ on display. But also another implication would be. So that we understand the ones that we are seeking to see saved. So that we understand the ones that we are seeking to see saved. We need to be able to know them and, and who they are. And it gives us compassion for them. In my, my Bible reading time, I was going through the book of Mark. And uh, Jesus says he went ashore, ashore and he saw a, a large crowd and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Now you may notice that I bolded the they were like. Did they have a shepherd? Yes. Yes, the Jews had a shepherd. It was God. It was very clear. And now Jesus is the good shepherd presenting himself. But he is seeing them live their life and the things that they do. And it, it broke his heart and it gave him a compassion for them. Because he could see how clueless they were. He could see how lost they were. We remember Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have what? Gone astray. Each of us our own path. Blind. Foolish, deceived, not understanding God's way. And this gives Jesus a heart of compassion. And so before we, we rake that person over the coals on the internet that, that comment about something, or before we, we throw that guy under the bus at work, we need to have compassion for them. Have compassion. First of all, if not for the grace of God, we would be the exact same as them. But then also, not just that, we need to know that they need Christ above all. So that we understand the ones we are seeking to save. It gives us compassion. All right. We also need to, to know our enemy. We need to know them. Not that we're going to fisticuffs with the unbelievers. But we are trying to win them to Christ. And they are opposed to God. And we need to understand. Why don't you believe? That's because you're foolish. Why do you do this? I don't understand it. Don't you see how it's destroying your family? Oh, you're, dece you're deceived. And that would be me except for the grace of God. So those are the implications from it. In 1 Peter 4, 3 through 5, it says, The time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desires of the Gentiles. Now, why do I mention that verse? Some would argue, well, okay, so to know the people I'm sharing the gospel with, I need to do the things that they do. I need to go drink the things that they're doing to excess. And I need to, to watch their movies and their TV shows. And that way I can relate to them. And 
You know what? My response to that, I already know how to sin. I am far too good at that. I do not need another lesson in that the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out those desires. It says in verse 5, In all this they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation and they malign you. Some will malign you and will hate you. Some will repent and come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is worth it. It is worth it. Let's look at these words. Starts out for, we also once were foolish ourselves. Now I know if it, if it bugs you that I put fools instead of foolish ourselves, feel free. There's plenty of space on your paper there, all right? But I just put fools. They are fools. They are without understanding. We know that from the book of Proverbs that the, the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So they have no fear of God. So they have no knowledge or understanding of who he is. They are simply fools. And how do fools act? Foolishly. They make bad decisions. They make terrible decisions. They, they walk away from what is good to them. If we look at the unbeliever and we say, why? Why would you build your house on the sand? Why don't you build it on the rock? That's what Jesus is saying. They don't get it. They're foolish. That's why they, they keep doing that. Why go down the broad path of destruction? It's not going to end well for you. It's because they don't know any better. They don't know any better. But why believe Joseph Smith who, who just made up a religion out of thin air? Why believe someone like Muhammad who, who even took scriptures to twist to serve his purpose? Or for that matter, why even believe Tom Cruise who's spreading his lies of Scientology all over the place and people are buying it hook, line, and sinker? Why not read the Bible and fall on your knees in repentance? Are you not reading the same crucifixion account that I'm reading? They are. But remember Ephesians 2, 1, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And so what I need to do is I need to understand that that's where they're at. And I need to enlist the assistance of my heavenly father, who is really the one doing all the work. God, please open up their foolish eyes to see your truth. I can't have a, a shiny enough PowerPoint. I can't have all of the right Bible verses and the, the conversation points to save them. They are a fool and they will always be a fool unless God works in their heart. So I need to pray to that end. Why believe that you can save yourself? Isn't that every major religion? Hey, what do you know? The end all be all. Do good works. You can save yourself. It doesn't happen that way doesn't happen that way. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. So they are not only fools, they are also disobedient. They are disobedient. Uh, you see this word also in Titus 1.16. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. They are detestable and disobedient. So even though God has created them and even though God owns them, they run from him. They, they fight him every step of the way in opposition. Uh, flip over to Colossians chapter 3. We see the same word in Colossians. Verse 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. In them you also walked when you were living in them. Paul is pointing out to the church at Colossae, that was you. But that's not you anymore. Sons of disobedience. And notice what happens to the sons of disobedience. God pours his wrath out upon them. So when I'm feeling tired, and when I'm feeling lazy, and I don't want to follow the things written here. When I don't want to open my mouth and share the good news of Jesus Christ, I need to remember that God's wrath will be poured out on the sons of disobedience. They are disobedient. 
And I need to call them to repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, one of the ultimate, you know, examples of disobedience. I, I would have used your own children, but, you know, you, that was, it wouldn't have worked, all right? Because your kids are so obedient. Um, the relationship between God and Israel. Romans 10, 21. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long, I have stretched out my hands to a what? Disobedient and obstinate people. I mean, are you kidding me? Everything that God did for Israel. All right, he, he brings them out of Egypt and even when they're at the, 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 the edge of the Red Sea and the Egyptians are coming, what do they do? Oh, I can't believe this. This is so bad. All right, then they, they get brought to the very end of the, the promised land and God says, go in. And they say, no, there's big people. There's giants in there. I'm not going in there. And even though God did everything for them and they had every reason to follow him, they walked away over and over and over again. That's, that's who's in your neighborhood. That's who's at your workplace. Don't be surprised by what they do because this is them. Pray for them and challenge them because the only hope they have is Jesus Christ. Number three, who we were. For we also once were deceived. Deceive. This word means to cause to wonder. Instead of, uh, of going after the one true God, uh, as I read earlier, Isaiah 53, 6, that all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have wandered away from him. Flip over to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verses 43 through 49. There was this debate about who Jesus was and apparently there were some orders that were given and they weren't quite followed in the apprehension of Jesus. Jesus in his teaching caused a division in verse 43. A division occurred in the crowd because of Jesus. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Don't you love that? Hey, you were supposed to get him and bring him in. Why didn't you do it? You should have heard him teach. No one has ever spoken as this man speaks. The Pharisees that answered them, you have not also been, what, deceived, have you? You haven't been led astray. And isn't that just terrible? Jesus, the shepherd, teaching them the true way. And they're saying, he's deceiving you. He's leading you astray. But we know the Pharisees were blind guides. Verse 48, no one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd which he does not know, the, but this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. Jesus teaching the truth right there in front of them. I, I mean, healing people, Walking on water, calming the storms, raising people from the dead, casting out demons. And they saw all of that and it just drove them farther and farther away from Jesus Christ because they were deceived. We also see that they are slaves to sin. They are fools. They are disobedient. They are deceived. They are slaves to sin. It says that they are enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. It's familiar in chapter 2 of Ephesians where they are walking uh, according to the, the course of the prince of the power of the air. They are held captive by their, what they want to do, what the flesh desires of them. They have no ability to cease from sin. They are slaves to multiple, various lusts, uh, wants, desires, wishes. Here in, in a negative context, in pleasures. And that word pleasure, we're familiar. The Greek word pleasure, that was where we get the word hedonism. That idea of that there is this devotion to pleasure as a way of life. Whatever satisfies you, whatever pleases you, that's the end all be all best thing. If it's adultery, go for it. If it's, if it's using foul language, go for it. If it's being mean and cruel to people, go for it. It's your pleasure. And your pleasure is so important. And they are enslaved to those things, to various lusts and pleasures. And they will only, they will only have freedom through Jesus Christ. Number five, 
They are childish. Now, I know it doesn't specifically say childish, but I can't figure out a better way to summarize spending our life in malice and envy, malice being wickedness, than to say childish. Here they have a God who loves them, a God who created them, a God who's saying, follow me, follow me, and I will work the things out of your life. You'll have joy, you'll have peace, you'll have patience, you'll have love, you'll have an eternal life. Instead of what are they doing? They're bickering over things. They're bickering over the toys in the nursery. They're jealous of what other people have. They drive through the neighborhoods and they say, oh, I just, I can't believe they got that. They don't deserve that. They're not that type of people. Oh, I, I need to, to go into more debt so I can get this, so I can look better for these people. And, and, and wickedness, just debauchery. It's childish. It doesn't make sense. But we apart from Christ don't have any sense. We are fools, consumed with hate, consumed with hate. I know it's, it's really small, but you see the first word hateful? That's an adjective. And I didn't put that on there for you, okay? You can figure out who that was to remind. And then the word hating, that is a, a verb. So you have an adjective which describes the people. Who are they? What are they like? What's this person like? Well, they're hateful. Yeah, who? Everyone apart from Christ. Oh, they're a loving, caring person. No, they aren't because even their love is so saturated with selfish motives that it's as if it was hate. They're hateful people, so they actively hate other people. They are consumed with hate. There is an active hate, uh, like you think of Cain. Cain hated Abel, so he killed him. In Matthew 5, 22, uh, remember Jesus said, if you have an angry thought in your heart towards someone, that is hate. But there is also, there is also a passive hate. All right, I, I'd like for you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And Jesus is teaching the people. He says this in Matthew chapter 25, verse 32. Actually, let's look at verse 31. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then he's going to address the sheep. We're going we're to skip down to verse 41 when he addresses the goats. He will also say to those on his left, these are the goats, these are the unbelievers in their day of judgment. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry. And you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Right? Ah, oh, Jesus, if I had saw you hungry, I think I would have remembered that. When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you as stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of it? Then he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. What's he saying there? If Jesus had been there, maybe to impress him, they would have done those things. But he says, my people, my sheep, you're supposed to fill their needs. You're supposed to love them. You're supposed to clothe them. You're supposed to do all of these things. And you cared not. You did not. And really, their neglect is an expression of their hatred. They love themselves so they won't give up their resources, their time and energy to love others. And what's the result? These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Go back to Titus. For we also once were and then we need to think we have been rescued out of that eternal damnation. But there are people out there that are, that are in our jobs and living next to us and playing at the park and on our, 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 our kids' baseball team and so forth. 
that they need Jesus. And so we understand who they are and how to share with them and we plead with God to give us the words and to use his Holy Spirit to save them. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, slaves to sin, childish and consumed with hate. Remember our implications are so that we understand not to act like that anymore. We don't act like that. We've been saved. We are different. But then also so that we understand the ones that we are seeking to see saved. The people that, that may spurn you and mock you and, and walk away. That's who they are. Don't be surprised. Trust in the Lord. Now as we continue on with the importance of the reminders we have seen who we were in verse 3. And then next we're going to see who happened to us. And if, it, if you like it better, you can put what happened to us. All right, because we were this and then something happened. It changed us. But when you look at verses 4 through 6, what really stood out to me was God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. And when God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus intervened in our life, we radically changed we radically change. So we're going to look at who happened to us. When we get to verse 7, we'll get to who we are now in verses 8 through 11, what we do now. But let's focus on what happened to us. And again, I know I'm, I'm skipping straight to the implications and then we'll walk back through this. What are the implications drawn from who happened to us? Well, number one, God needs to happen to them. God needs to happen to these people. Remember, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, and so are they, and they will never change without God in their life. Number two, God could happen to them. God could do it. You ever fall in that trap where you think someone's just too far off? Oh, you don't know this person. They are just such a sinner. There's no way that God could ever work in their life. There's a number of illustrations in the Bible that we could go to and people we could talk about. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, all right, pagan as pagan is, he comes to know the Lord. You talk about Saul. Saul became, was, was killing Christians, was persecuting them, and God saved them. We think of ourselves. You know how wicked you were, and God saved you, washed you by the blood of the Lamb. Well, underneath who happened to us, we need to also remember that God could use you to happen to them. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And I know we, we've already been in Romans some. Romans 10 verse 14. How then... Actually, go back to verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Skip down to verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. When we look at these people and how they're described by Paul, nothing will change unless God happens to them. And we need to remember that God could happen to them. That God could save them. And God may desire you to be the very thing that shows them their sin and leads them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Going back to Titus chapter 3, our outline for verses 4 through 6 would be God the Father in verses 4 and 5a. God the Holy Spirit at the end of verse 5. And God the Son. And God the Son. Let's look at this together. Verse 3. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. 
We were that fool, that disobedient, deceived person, childish and enslaved to lust. But God saved us. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. God happened to us. God the Father, which leads us into God the Holy Spirit. Look at the end of verse 5. By the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. Now we don't have time tonight to get into the, the details of that. I'd like to come back to that next Sunday night. But it's the Holy Spirit that he used to, to call us and to draw us and to wash us and to renew us and to make us new in Christ. So we're not verse 3 anymore because of the work of the Holy Spirit, because of the love of the Father. And then we see God the Son. Oh, so important. At the end of verse 5, renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Christ happened to us. He confronted me with my sin. He showed me that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man came to the Father but through him. That he was my Lord, my Savior. And I needed to repent of everything I had ever done and everything I had ever thought. And I needed to turn and confess him as Lord of all. Let's go ahead and we're going to, these are some of the examples from sinner to saint, Nebuchadnezzar, Paul, the Philippian jailer, and so on. But as we, as we wrap this up, as we conclude this, this idea of living an evangelistic life, with our reminders, we live those out because of their importance and what they can accomplish. We've looked at who we were, what happened to us. Lord willing, next week we'll look at who we are now and what we do now, but I just have a couple of questions Will you use this doctrine as motivation to continue to grow in sanctification? Put Jesus on display more because of these wonderful teachings. Will you use it to have a compassion and motivation to share the good news of Jesus Christ? That's what I was. This is who I am now. Don't you want to be like this? Not because I'm great, but because God is great and awesome. Will you use this as a foundation for godly living, knowing that you are not saved by your good deeds, but now that you have been saved, you walk in those good deeds? Will you use this as an encouragement to share the good news of Jesus Christ? Maybe tonight you're not a believer. Maybe you're only here because your, your wife made you come or, or your mom made you come or your dad forced you into that seat you are still foolish. You are still disobedient. You are still deceived. You are still enslaved to sin. You are living this life instead of for the glory of God, for your childish pursuits. And you are hateful. But God, God can save you. God can save you. Not because of your good deeds, but looking at how wicked and awful you are if you repent and trust in Christ. He will save you not on the basis of deeds which you have done in righteousness, but according to the washing and regeneration of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out richly through us in Christ Jesus. Come to Jesus. Believe in him now. Gain eternal life and eternal knowledge and live for him. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you are truly a great and awesome God. And we are in awe of you and we are so thankful for this passage. If you hadn't interacted, Lord, if you hadn't uh, uh, shaken me up, if you hadn't worked in my heart, I'd still be lost. I'd still be lost, living for myself. But Lord, you, you did reach into my life and you confronted me with my sin. And now I want to live for you, God. And I know that that's the same thing with many people here tonight. We see how bad we were. And we want to see other people come to Jesus. Because we love Jesus. And we love you. Give us the words. Give us the opportunities. May we be bold for you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.